All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm happy to see you all, but I, I want to start. I'd like to begin by acknowledging we're all gathered here today on the ancestral homelands of Native nations and indigenous peoples past, present, and future. I acknowledge and pay respects to the Muscogee Creek people whose care and keeping of these lands allow us to be gathered here today. It's my great pleasure to be up here today. I just want to say that you're at our closing general session and we have some great programming. And I apologize. I switched my notes around a great deal. I don't think anybody else has been there uh, ever. So if you see me read a bit more, this is not my nature. <laughs> but it's good to keep me on script. So we're going to be joined by leaders from tribal colleges and historically black universities who will share their thoughts and stories from their institutions. And I'm very excited about that. To those of you that I have not met, I've been here, what, 52 days? Anybody else been tracking the times I say the numbers I've been here? 52 days now. I'm the new VP for network services, and I couldn't be happier. Uh, it's a, been a great pleasure to be here this week and have you all have to listen to me, but I've, had a, got, I've gotten a great opportunity to listen from so many of you. I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank our great program committee for forming the content and the schedule for this meeting and our generous sponsors who have supported this event. I mean, none of this would be possible without them. So I've been involved in this community for quite a few years. Uh, I think uh, I was reflecting that uh, one of the first meetings I remember, the first community events for Internet 2 was back in 1998 and uh, in San Francisco. Anybody in the room was at that, that event? There we go, Cass, one of our great, our great hosts here in, in Atlanta. Um, so that was phenomenal, but this is my first time uh, as a member of Internet 2, so it's a very different experience. And so uh, I have a tendency, especially after lunch when we're falling asleep maybe, uh, raise your hands if you're a first time attendee. Oh, there's so many of you. <laughs> All I know is I personally have enjoyed the elevator fiascos <laughs> because I've learned sometimes you have to go up to get down. <laughs> and so, but one of the things that's been phenomenal is I met several first time attendees during that time in those elevators. In fact, a couple of times I didn't realize we could actually physically squeeze that many people into the elevator. So for those of you that got to know each other really well, uh, that's not typically the nature, but it was such a great opportunity. I wanna say, I, I like to look at the positive side, so I, I really enjoyed that elevator time and meeting many of you. And it, I know there was about 20 of you, maybe even more, I can't count, uh, that raised your hands. I hope we get a chance to meet. Um, my contact information has been broadly published. I'd love to talk to you. So I do want to say that uh, spending this time, I've learned a lot. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the workshops and the tutorials and the sessions that we've had. And uh, I'm going to have to go back and consume a lot of it from the, from the, present, the presentations and the recordings. But right now, what I'd like to do is announce that uh, we're going to have another chance to meet in person, and that'll be at the uh, 2023 Technology Exchange. I'm looking this up. I can't remember all these dates. September 18th through 22nd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The program and the registration will be posted later this month, and I'm very excited because my background, very technical, and a lot of you in here, very technical, and many of you should get more technical because there's so much you can do with a little bit of tools that you're in, in your hands. So hope to see many of you out there. It's a great venue, and it's a very excited about that. But now, what we're really, really here for is Anna Hun Hunsinger. Is she around here? All right, Anna. So she's, get, she's the VP of Community Engagement, and I want to invite her to the stage where she'll be leading this esteemed panel and uh, continue our programming. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I also, uh, I apologize, I want to make sure I stick to uh, a script here because I have some really important points to make with you today. So uh, let's get started here. Um, oops, how do I go back? Okay. So why are we are here today? There's a growing recognition and a sense of urgency among the Internet2 community to uplift every organization that aspires to contribute to research and education. Looking back at the last couple of decades, Internet2's engagement with historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges and universities 
was extremely limited, to say the least. For years, our colleagues at these institutions have been responsible for nurturing their students, supporting their faculty, and uplifting their communities. The expertise, ideas, perspectives from HBCUs and TCUs need to be more fully brought to bear on the scientific and societal changes facing our country, and quite frankly, our planet. Okay, so let me give you, uh, just to set the context, uh, a few facts, okay? According to data from the Congressional Bipartisan HBCU Caucus, HBCUs contribute nearly 15 billion, B, billion, to our annual economy and have provided pathways of opportunity to millions of Americans, many of whom are first-generation college students. HBCUs produce 42% of black engineers, 47% of black women engineers, 50% of all black lawyers, 50% of all black public school teachers, and 80% of all black judges. HBCUs equip and strategically empower black students to be their authentic selves and embody who they desire to be through a healthy and supportive environment unique to how these schools are structured. While HBCUs do their share of producing black graduates with STEM degrees, there's a greater need for equity throughout the education pipeline and in workforce hiring practices. Tribal colleges and universities. For over 50 years, tribal colleges and universities have provided a path for American Indian students to have access to a higher education grounded on native cultures and traditions, providing them with the opportunity to launch their careers and serve their communities, while creating a better future for themselves and their families. Tribal colleges and universities are located nationwide, from the mid Midwest to the Southwest to the Plains, and the Northern Rockies, serving diverse Indian nations. Despite these, dif these differences, all TCUs share three basic criteria. They are tribally charter, their boards are comprised of a majority of Native Americans, and the student body is comprised of a majority of Native Americans. Okay, so uh, how can we collectively, here as a community, uh, some of you, some of us as community, uh, a community of senior administrators or leaders to, okay, those that we care deeply about enabling IT services to advance the research, education, and service missions of our institutions. How can we collectively advocate for the inclusion and success of historically underserved institutions? We're going to begin a bit of a journey with meaningful and respectful engagements with our colleagues at HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities so that we can listen, listen to, and learn, learn from them as we work to address systemic inequities. That is why, and I get excited, but also I'm so humble here. I'm so, that's why it's just such an honor and a privilege uh, to introduce our panelists. Okay, so I'm going to call them here on the screen uh, if, uh, here at, uh, to join me in stage. Let me start first by introducing Dr. Sandra Boham, the president of Salish Kootenai College, a TCU serving the Bitterroot Sa Salish, the Kootenai, and the Ponderé tribes in Montana. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Next, let me introduce Ms. Deshaun Miguel, Director of Information Technology at Ton Otom Community College, a tribal college serving the Tokotom, sorry, uh, getting better at pronouncing it, uh, in southwestern Arizona. Please join us. Next, Dr. Joseph Whitaker, the Vice President for Research and Economic Development and also Associate Provost at Jackson State University, a public HBCU in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. 
And last, but definitely not least, Dr. Urban Wiggins, Vice Provost for Decision Science and Visualization from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, a public HBCU in Princess Anne, Maryland. Okay, so thank you, all of you. Uh, appreciate you being here. So uh, I'm gonna kick us off with uh, a request of, for each of you. Uh, even though I mentioned where you come from and said, and said who you are, uh, could you please, um, uh, each of you, take a few minutes to now introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit more about your role, uh, your, your institution, your organization, and also, uh, of course, anything else you want to share. Um, but it'd be great if you could also share uh, the cultural and historical significance of the HBCU or TCU designation to your institution's identity. So let's start with you, President Boham, um, you. if it's okay with you. Hex Glex, Kisik Whitnam. Pesia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Salish Kootenai College is located on the Flathead Indian Reservation. I am an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Um, the, tribe was the college was chartered by the tribe, and the tribal council appoints our board members. All of our board members are members of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Tribal colleges are critically important to our communities. When we think about Indians and reservations and the distinct, unique role that we have with the federal government, most people have no idea what that means. And it's not intentional. It's just that we are such a small segment of the population that we don't make it into the history books and often people have no idea that we're here or what our reservations are like. And so tribal colleges were formed and they're incredibly mission-driven institutions. And it was a way for us to take back control of our education and meet our needs for our tribal nations. And so that's what it started with. I want to give you a little context. Many times when we think about Indian education, we think about Indians and the impact of things like boarding schools as long time ago. But I'm going to tell you my grandmother, not my great-grandmother, my grandmother, went to boarding school in Flandreau, South Dakota. The reason she went there was because it's far enough away that you can't run away and get back home. My mother attended boarding school on the reservation where we are now. And she boarded there through most of her, well, until she reached high school. And then I attended there as a day school student. So the boarding part of it ended. But the day school was there. And what's important to know is the same teachers that were there were the same teachers my mother had. So that method and what they were doing, it stayed. And so by doing, by having a tribal college, we said, we need to perpetuate our language and culture. We need to develop the people that are going to run our tribal government and our tribal nation with our values. And so that's where the tribal colleges come from. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. OK. Uh, why don't we go next to Dr. Whitaker? Oh, thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, from the HBCU perspective, and I guess um, my, myself and Dr. Wiggins can go back and forth and, as to why we are here and how important that is. But um, I think overall, um, the historically black colleges and universities came about for much of the same reasons serving a purpose in a population that was largely overlooked, ignored, and undervalued. And can't say much of that has changed. It has been modified a little bit and a little bit more sophisticated, but we still have those challenges, and that's part of the reason we're here having that conversation. So I'll just lay that out as a context, and I'll say 
As for me, I'm there, I'm the Vice President for Research, as you heard. My background is physiology, biophysics, and neuroscience. And um, spend a lot of time working in academia, spend some time working with NASA as well, as, um, both as a researcher early and administrator later on. Um, so I've been around the block a little bit. Um, for now, I am, as the Vice President for Research, um, responsible for the stewardship of everything research and development, economic development and otherwise at Jackson State University. I've been there five years. Prior to that, I um, actually worked in Maryland and here in Atlanta. I was 14 years at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And that was a time when somebody once said, black people can't do brain research. So I was the crazy guy who helped to start the first neuroscience research center, brain research center at Morehouse School of Medicine. First. <clears throat> So that was first of its kind, and I was doubted the entire way that you couldn't do that and it wasn't possible. But a few, three years after we did that, did that, everybody was surprised we were successful, and so now you have 12 more that was designed off of that. So, and as well as a cardiovascular institute. And the current director of NHLBI at NIH, he was the first director of the cardiovascular institute that was modeled off that. So, you know, with all the doubts and the naysaying, um, I, I just lay that context because I think it's appropriate for the kinds of conversations we're having and <clears throat> how we've been undervalued in terms of expertise, knowledge, capabilities, and the people who we've mentored and trained historically. So most of the HBCU started out as, as something related to a church, as a teacher's college, or agricultural school, or something of that nature because that was how black folks were perceived. Um, that hasn't changed much, by the way, but we're working towards changing that, and that's part of our job and responsibility why we're here. Now we're in a, in a place where there's a recognition that, okay, we need to be more inclusive and diversify and all of that. Um, we still can't get that right, right? Hence, the continuation of the conversation. Part of it is a lot of our institutions, black, white, otherwise are stuck or placed in the middle of communities that they don't even serve because they don't look like us, right? And so when we talk about diversity and inclusion, sometimes we establish, or, 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 or the powers that be and the people with the resource establish these institutions with the notion that this is a perfect foundation on which to build. You better come in and adapt to what we do. So, but right now you recognize that it's a flawed foundation on which now you want all, everybody else to come in and just adapt and grow and no other accommodations are made. And, and so we have to rethink some of those models. For us, we serve the population that look like us that's been undervalued, under-resourced, and ignored largely. We've, we've been able to move them from where they are, not being included, not being educated, to now being individuals who can perform and demonstrate that they can make significant contribution, not just in this country, but globally. You heard the numbers that coming out of HBCUs. Um, that's just a drop in the bucket in terms of the impact that we've had in our respective communities, and we can do so much more. Given the resources, given the access to um, the capabilities, and thankfully internet too, and <laughs> MSCC, you're actually providing us with a platform to help to do this, and we actually thank you. We have a lot of work to do and a long way to go. Um, hopefully we can continue this conversation and I, I can expand on any one of these things that I mentioned. But in terms of where we are, we are making some significant stride. We are actually training people who've been ignored. Once we train them and they start performing, somehow they're viewed as being fit to go into a PWI setting and now perform and go to graduate school and all of these things. We have to change that narrative. Come into our spaces, work with us directly. We're also inclusive. So come in, work with us as, as equal equity partners and see what we can do and we can change the world for ourselves as well as you. Look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Whitaker. Deshaun, could you go next? Okay. 
school code putting it on your to get the Sean Miguel I am on chief gun Donald them community college good afternoon everyone my name is the Sean Miguel I am the IT director for Donald them community college um, Donald them and we are Donald them community college is headquartered on the Donald nation we are 4,400 my um, 60 square feet square miles across the Sonoran Desert in Arizona. Um, and um, it is my honor to be here and to serve as the IT director and um, to serve um, and represent our tribal colleges. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm really nervous. Um, it's okay. I just want to thank Internet2 um, MCC for giving us the opportunity to be here and represent the underserved um, communities. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so um, I just, uh, I, uh, one thing I wanna share about Donald the Community College is that we're very unique. And I always um, have, you know, when I present myself, I always make sure to um, include my introduction in our language because um, that I keep that very close to my heart, and um, uh, as I present myself, I also um, strongly um, produce my um, our Tshawshan, which is our core values, and our Hamadak that we um, we uh, we embed in ourselves to um, serve our people and our nation. So, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Wiggins. Hello, I am Dr. Urban Wiggins. I'm the Vice Provost for Decision Science at UMES. Um, University of Maryland Eastern Shore is a member of the University System of Maryland. And we're one of four HBCUs located in the state of Maryland. UMES is not its original name. University, University UMES, was originally called Maryland State College. The claim to fame for, you, for Maryland State College is that it holds, the world, it holds the Guinness Book World Record for the greatest number of football players in the Super Bowl to start in that game. <laughs> I'm gonna take it where I can get it, okay? <laughs> so Maryland State College later became a part of the University System of Maryland and its name, name was subsequently changed to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. We're located on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. We are about 30 miles south of the Delaware border on that little peninsula to the right of DC. So if I drive 30 miles to the east, I'm in the Atlantic. If I drive 30 miles to the west, I'm swimming across the Chesapeake Bay going to DC. So because of our physical location, geographical location, we are a little bit out in the middle of, you pass nowhere, then you'll find us. <laughs> we are, by, def by definition, we're, iPads define us as a town fringe institution. So you pass up the town, get lost, and keep going, and then you, here we are. And as such, we have had, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Some students come because they're really trying to get away and get an education, and they really can afford to be away from the distractions that you would find at a large city. And that's great. Many parents love the fact that you're away from all of the activities that would distract you. You can now focus on your studies. Many students find that it's torture and mom and dad send me away to boarding school. <laughs> so we have that dynamic at UMES and we have very specialized programs in different areas. UMES has one of the, one of the only aviation programs along with Tuskegee. We're located on the Eastern Shore. Um, UMES also has a pharmacy program. We actually, ju we just had the grand opening of our new pharmacy building about two weeks ago. So UMES has a population of about 2,500 students today and in 2015 we had peaked up around 4,500 students. 
it did a decline after that period of time, and then COVID came, and as you know, that's how things developed. And that's the University of, East, University of Maryland Eastern Shore where I've been for the last six years. I spent f several years as uh, assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. I am a born and raised Cajun. I am from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to, I attended Southern University for my bachelor's, my master's. I actually attended Southern University High School when I was during K-12. And my father worked on the university campus, so I literally grew up on an HBCU campus. And I, as you mentioned, I was educated with my bachelor's and master's in math and computer science at Southern and went to LSU, where that was a difference in environments. I went from an HBCU to a PWI as a student and saw that there was a stark change. It was a bit different. And me being in a program of 130 students and there were only six, 12 Americans and three were black. And I am the first black to receive a PhD in computer science from LSU. That was a bit different. That difference is one of the things that keeps me focused on, I don't want others to miss out. This education opportunity is great. And being a part of MSCC, being a part of, affiliated with Internet2, we are providing the environment for those students to be able to move forward, for those students to receive those opportunities. Even if it's something light, where you're just doing an introduction, they get to work with a supercomputer. Those are the things that will maybe spark their interest, give them an idea, create the next greatest something. But we're focused here, and my focus is to make sure that we open that environment up so that they can have that opportunity. Let it be that it will not be because, oh, I wish I had an opportunity to learn this. No, I'm going to do as much as I can to allow for those students to get those opportunities and move forward. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, all of you. For So uh, let's get this conversation going. Um, I just want to bring up, and I really appreciate that you all presented a great segue uh, to talk about students, OK? Uh, HBCUs and TCUs are key to ensuring America's STEM pipeline, just to name one thing, and to ensure that that pipeline is strong. As we pursue efforts to diversify the STEM fields, black students at HBCUs and native students at tribal colleges and universities are more likely to get a STEM degree and they're more likely to graduate in general. It is impossible to have a diverse and inclusive workforce without HBCUs and TCUs. So that's, with that context here, and again, let's focus on students. And I would really like to now uh, ask uh, each of you if you could share with us a story some stories, on your ongoing efforts to support your students and prepare them to be the future workforce. Let's get started with Dr. Whitaker, and then uh, we'll go from there. I'm on the spot again. So um, let me say, um, after I joined Jackson State uh, five years ago as the VP for research, um, actually, I told the president on the, on the day that I showed up, I said, I will only be here if I can do one, one simple thing, and that was to open or establish a center for innovation on the campus. And he said, oh, that sounds okay. And he said, where will it be, engineering or business? I said, neither. And he goes, wait a minute. I said, oh, no, you wait a minute. It's gonna be in the middle of campus to serve every single student that, that comes on this, on this um, campus. And so he said, okay, go ahead. So, and if, if you look at our website or look at anything we're doing at Jackson State, you will see that center appear. So it's a center for innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic development. And it was very strategic because we wanted to make sure that we had a place where we could um, enhance or complement all the things that were happening on the campus. And considering the trend of where um, science and technology and everything else was going. Um, on the resource, yes. But the question was, 
So how are you going to support this? I say, I don't know yet. Just, we'll figure it out. My philosophy, of course, um, true to understanding what it takes to um, be in an HBCU environment, when you are under-resourced, um, you have to be at your most creative and innovate. And so we take that to heart. And so what we did was establish this, this innovation center um, and strategically through um, creative partnerships to help to um, equip, build, and outsource this. And Dr. Dent helped us a little bit most times. Yeah. <laughs> but um, she's, a, she's a true partner on the campus in making this happen, make sure all our technology platforms are, are working seamlessly. But we hire students in that center as innovation fellows. They run that facility. And that facility, just to shorten the story a little bit, actually now serves the entire campus, faculty and student teams working in tandem on different projects and problems. We have grand challenge um, exercises where faculty students can actually solve problems. This is where most of our tech partners come to actually interface with our students and, and faculty. And we also invite small businesses in the community who are struggling to move their businesses forward or their spin-off or startups to actually engage with individuals there so they can, they can take advantage of the knowledge capital that are there. Our students actually, because we, we are challenged with numbers of faculty and all of these things, most of the time our curricular, curriculum are quite rigid. Um, the flexibility is not there. So all the additional things that they need to enhance their courses, we start out in that, in that space, um, offered generally by our partners who come to the table. And the students actually go to class, they communicate with their colleagues who go off to other campuses and they compare notes. Oh, I'm a first year just like you are a sophomore. This is what I'm doing. Are you doing this? No. So they come and they talk about that and said, we would like to get access to these different things or capabilities and technologies. And we try to make that happen. And so they are fully um, engaged in their own learning, development of their own um, academic um, development. And they get to interface with our external partners. And most of those kids are doing amazingly well. And it's amazing to see students from the arts and humanities working together with computer engineering, electrical engineering students to solve meaningful problems that um, are significant to them and to the people they work with. Um, so at the front and center of everything that we do, the students are first. And <laughs> Faculty don't like to hear that, so they're, they're a good number two. Um, but the students are front and center. We put things in place just to make sure they can um, see the future, see something different from what they're used to and what um, they never see from working with their, their parents who most of the time didn't get that level of education. And so we try to make sure um, they get a broader worldview and that there's no limit to what they can accomplish. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bohan. This is an interesting question. Um, at Salish Kootenai College, there are a number of things that we do to support our students, but we really start supporting students before they become Salish Kootenai College students. Um, American Indian children are still not graduating from high school at the same rate as everybody else on the reservation. We have seven school districts and one tribally operated high school. And we find that students are fairly well convinced that they will not be successful initially by the third grade, but for sure by the sixth grade. And so what we have to do is help students to understand that they can and are capable to do anything that they want to do. And so we're an open admission school, which means we'll take anyone, and we take students where they are, and then we support them to get where they need to be. So we do a lot of work in repairing um, students' confidence levels, give them lots of success in the classroom with lots of typical supports that you would find around 
tutoring and um, those kinds of things. But where the real support for those students comes from is that 90% of our students have food insecurity. And so um, they don't know that they will have food to last to the end of the month for them and their family. We have mental health issues. And so um, we have made mental health accessible and then we've worked around normalizing the discussion around asking for help and that it's okay. Now on the reservation, everybody knows everybody and gossip is a form of entertainment. And so if you drive down the road and you see somebody's car at Tribal Health by where the mental health section is, you go, oh, so-and-so's over there getting mental health counseling, and then you're kind of reticent to go. So we have a lot of face-to-face -face options, but we also have a number of um, online telehealth, and our students fill every single appointment they can get. We're maxed all the time. But we found that by getting students that kind of help, they do a lot better in their classes, their children do a lot better, and we have not had um, the level of suicide ideation and suicides on our campus that we have had previously before we did that. I will tell you that one of the things we learned, which we knew, but we were hoping the rest of the world would see, is that when students have adequate funding, they can focus on being students. And they're not worried about, can they pay the rent? Can they get their child to child care? Can they afford for a school tr uh, field trip for their child to be able to participate? All of those kinds of things impact our students. So we work a lot with our students around every aspect of their life. It's fully a wraparound system. And we do a lot of mentoring. We also went through and looked at a lot of our part-time employment where we um, hired people in the community and we said, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna hire the students. So they could have jobs on campus, not work study. These are regular jobs that we would have hired someone else for, um, that we can work around their schedules and then they have an income. Um, we have a lot of scholarships that we fundraise for and we do a lot of institutional tuition waivers. That might sound like a simple thing, but I'm gonna tell you that the way we're funded, we have to maintain 52% American Indian, and they cannot be self-identified. So when we do our student count, we actually collect what's called a Certificate of Degree of Indian Blood, which is their formal registration from their tribe that says, yes, this person is a member of our tribe and we are federally recognized. And we have to document that for every single student. So if you're native, but you're not enrolled somewhere, you don't count as native. And we get very, very little funding. We're only one of two schools in the, in the um, only one of two states in the nation that receive some state level funding for our schools and it's at half of what they give um, other um, schools similarly. But they did it the same way the federal government did, which is they make a pot of money, we all turn in our enrollment, and then they divide the pie up, but they don't put more money in it. So you, it's an interesting mix, but we still welcome people. And we know what our students need, and we ask a lot of the people that work there because it's very mission driven and if it's not in your heart and soul to help students, people won't stay. Our faculty and staff won't stay because you have to be committed to what we're trying to do. And so those are the kinds of things that we do for our students and we support their families as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Wiggins, you uh, have, you have your students too. Yes, um, I've, done, I've done a couple of things for my students. Let me go back one step so to set the stage. The federal government looks at what we call the graduation rate. That graduation rate is a six-year window. Now, that six-year window begins the first day when they're first-time freshmen in the fall, and they have, they're given six years to graduate. So if you have 100 students come in in that fall, 
How many graduate within that six-year time span? That's your graduation rate. Sounds simple, except a caveat. Just as she says, you will invite all students, regardless to where they are. The six-year graduation rate is generally based upon an assumption that when you're going to college, you're college ready. You don't need the additional supports in mathematics because you're now ready to take collegiate level math. That is the math that counts towards your graduation. My students don't arrive college ready. It's been established for quite some time that many students finish K-12, they are not prepared or they are under prepared. So it may take you a year, two classes, to be ready for your first math. Wait a minute. The university, however, still operates within that six-year window. We don't get a grace period because K-12, this student went through K-12 and is not ready. We don't get an asterisk by it. So we're still held to that standard of six years. And we're compared to other institutions who that student would never be admitted. They wouldn't get in. So they don't have that burden to, to attend to. So what we started doing, I like how you said you, you have students who have needs and they're not necessarily academic. So we're addressing the academic need with our classes. We did a symposium. The theme of our symposium, imposter syndrome. We later found out officially it's imposter phenomenon but at the time, we didn't know any better, so we named it imposter syndrome. Because we had students who were in college who completely felt that they did not belong, they didn't deserve to be there, and they weren't ready. So we had a, we had a symposium where we brought individuals. We had g gentlemen from NASA, we had individuals from North Lockheed Martin, we had spokespersons from FBI. We had individuals from different areas to come in and speak to our students about imposter phenomenon and how it could affect them in multiple ways. The key for them is that they were able to articulate to others and hear from others that what you feel is an actual feeling, and it's okay to feel that way, but understand that that's not the end of the story. We can proceed, you can go on. And in doing so, in having that type of honest, forthright conversation with our students and providing a safe place where they can actually have that conversation it allowed for much more of a discussion that I think we were even prepared for at the time. We had it slated on a Saturday that ended at noon. We ended up kicking them out of the building by two. It was that intense, but we provided, realized that that's something we need to do a little bit more of, providing them with more opportunity to see those that have actually gone through that process. And it's not simply we had individuals who were black who were at industry, and they were saying, hey, I'm in a room, and majority of the engineers don't look like me. And the, my guest from FBI was a white female, and she started laughing, and she said, she said outright in front of everyone, she said, oh, I'm not black, but I am a white female in the FBI. I know imposter syndrome every day because the majority of FBI is all male. And those type of scenarios opened up dialogue and allow for our students to have these conversations, allow for us to now take that information to our social services area and tell them, hey, this is what we're seeing, and then allow our students to have a pathway to address it. The end result is we started having more open conversations and more type of non-technical symposiums that allowed our students to express themselves, to say, hey, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable. Okay, well, let's talk about this. This is where you need to go. This is the person you can see. Everything is done in private. You're, you're welcome to join. And that open dialogue allowed for the students to, who were quiet, who never engaged, 
because we all know that if a student is not engaged in college, the retention is gonna be an issue. They don't return. Well, it allowed for that engagement. It allowed for different things to progress. Now, I can't say that it was a rip-roaring success because COVID came and changed the world, but we do know that that was a change in the, in the spirit of the students in the next semester. They were more content, they were happier to come, and they had, we had more dialogue. It's a beginning. I can't say right now how things are gonna turn out because COVID kind of changed that around, but we know that that was the big thing. That was a huge opening for our students. Thank you, thank you. This is when I wish we had a lot more time, but, uh, but we don't. So uh, let's, uh, let's say to, um, you know, we are at an Internet 2 event. Uh, we talk a lot about technology and things around technology, right? And uh, I'll just share with all of you uh, that, you know, one of many key themes that has come up in the consultations and the work with many of uh, the campuses that are coming together through the Minority Serving Cyber Infrastructure Consortium, and also informed by a number of stakeholder surveys that we've done uh, that have uh, received responses from HBCUs, TCUs, and other minority serving institutions. A prevailing theme has been cybersecurity, okay, front and center, and of course, um, a lot of other things. And uh, what I'd like to just ask a couple of you to elaborate, okay, so obviously cybersecurity, we think it's a broad area, right, with lots of things, but if you could expand a little bit about also, um, you know, in the, in the context of your role too and your uh, institution, you know, are there things too here that you'd like to share about, you know, both the technology, the, the constant concerns around cybersecurity, and perhaps also how your institution then is also supporting, uh, you know, through the use of technology against this concern, right? Other important infrastructure, and by infrastructure I mean it could be way beyond uh, what we think are just networks, right? There could be much more that your institution, your institution has to worry about. So. Uh, Deshaun, I'd like to start with you because uh, you're in the hands-on, right, in running the technology organization. So um, what do you think and anything you'd like to share with us in this domain? Um, I think at the leadership level and, um, and tech, my, my technical background has been an eye-opener around cybersecurity. Um, I, you know, TOCC was, you know, where we're growing and expanding and our student, uh, we're getting more and more students um, and serving them. And this was an uh, eye-opener for me because TOCC um, lacked, you know, the knowledge and technical uh, knowledge with, you know, and retaining employees within the IT department. So I've been at TOCC for over, what, eight years and um, IT was not, at the level uh, of administrations as it should have been. And so I kind of fought my way up to um, be, um, be on the leadership team and to show them that cybersecurity IT is very important and that's something that uh, a concern we need to consider. Um, and so uh, my, I think cybersecurity just keeps me on my toes and also keeps my mind engaged. Um, but also to, um, you know, educate our students and our um, staff and faculty to um, be aware of this and know that is it, it is out there. And um, I think um, one of the big things is, um, you know, having to specialize in that area, having somebody to um, be more experienced in that area, but also trying to, you know, figure ways, figure figure out ways how to uh, support um, tribal colleges and um, the cybersecurity initiative, so. Thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, President Boham, um, I wonder if you could talk about, um, you know, in your context, of course, you're a president, but also what are other things that, uh, not what keeps you up at night, but in this domain, too, and you know, uh, if you could share with us some of the things that also through your school, through your community, to um, kind of 
you know, get to this complex uh, concerns, of course, with security, but also the role uh, of your institution and your community in uh, supporting uh, or, um, you know, not keeping you on your toes, but, uh, you know, but, but what are you doing? You know, again, because we're an embedded um, institution that is really um, focused on meeting the needs of our, of our community and our students and our tribal nation, you know, we, we offer everything at our tribal college from um, an alternative high school degree program to a master's degree. So we're all about access. And what we found and what has been a real struggle is that our students live in communities that do not have broadband capacity at all. And so when we try to um, reach out to those communities and we provide hotspots or you know, hubs where they can park outside of a building in their car with their laptop, that makes our um, IT people a little bit crazy as they try to make sure that there's not a tax on those external systems that come in and then wreak havoc with our um, on-campus um, networks. So there's a lot of work around, you know, what do you look at on the internet? What don't you look at? We do a lot of in instruction with faculty, staff, and students because that ac equity issue is a huge one for us because if they don't have access to the, the systems that they, they need, if we don't have the resources that we need to provide those services, then it really does limit the access that our community will have to education. But the other thing around cybersecurity that we're dealing with is the whole issue of data sovereignty and managing that data and who owns it. You know, um, our communities are really strong. We're not just our, you know, we're more than our barriers. We're more than our challenges. We tend to kind of focus on those things, but we're an incredibly resilient people. And um, so as we're looking at incorporating indigenous um, methodologies into research and how we work, it's no longer two and four. It's with and about. And so who then has control of that? And how do we protect it within our systems so that it, um, it serves the people that are trying to answer the questions. And that is a big one. And it's not resolved, and it's going to be a while. Um, but I know that that's something that we're working very hard at determining, um, how that gets managed. Thank you. Um, again, I wish we had more time, because there are so many things that we could continue to discuss. Um, I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions, but I have one final question for the panel, and we're going to make this fun. In this order, I'm going to ask each of you to spend just a few minutes, okay, uh, sharing with us. So let's think about the future, okay? I'm going to ask you to think about the future. So how uh, each of you ambition your equal participation with the research and education community? Okay, so again, we're gonna go this way. <laughs> okay. So Dr. Wiggins, kick us off. Um, my interaction with research, I'm in the position as vice provost. For me, it's twofold because I also engage in the classroom, is to kind of change the environment that we're used to. Um, oftentimes, students, they have the theoretical foundation in our programs, but they lack the practical experience. And I'd love to see my students be a little bit more engaged with that so that they are looking at not only having that practical experience, so when they actually complete that degree, they actually can be more hands-on and work, go directly into the field. But I also must admit that there's another side of things that I would like to see move toward with research in the sense of it's almost kind of a shame that we, we're not really stressing to that teaching and research is a direction that our students can go in. Because if all of my students go to work at Northrop Grumman, go to work at Lockheed Martin, go to work at Walmart, in the corporate office, of course, um, <laughs> we're talking 
I have to ask the next question. Um, who's going to teach my grandkids? And I'm the son of a two professors. Who's going to teach my next? And we're creating, we are very good at creating great things with very little. With that being said, it would be great if I trained students, maybe not all, but some, to go into research, to create the next great thing with, frankly, little or with nothing. We're talking about smart cities. We're talking about cars that are autonomous. We're talking about, well, if all my students are working at corporations that are keeping things functioning, who's doing the next, the next? So for me, I'm looking to set that environment so that they can choose to go into the next, go into the research, go into the classroom. It's not a bad thing to say that you're a teacher. It's a very, very good thing to say. You can make a living doing that. And no, you won't necessarily Jay-Z ball out, <laughs> but you will be able to support your family. I'm testament of it. I'm not, I, look, I've, yeah, I'm insulated, I'm not starving, so hey, that's a hint. <laughs> but in all honesty, we can teach our students. So for me, it's not just simply today teaching them to go to work, because IT needs people today, but they need for us to create for tomorrow, not just create the next big thing, but to keep education moving forward for the next innovative thing. And that's, for me, what I see and what I'm actually striving toward. Thank you, Dr. Wiggins. Go teachers. No. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, Deshaun, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, see, education, I think education is um, very important, you know, to our Autumn students and, you know, um, I guess just providing the resources and enhancing the workforce development um, um, department that we do have on campus and also just providing all the resources um, that's available to our students um, locally and um, you know um, online and I think just setting you know setting the momentum from here on out to stabilize and support our students and provide all the resources that is needed um, in Indian country and um, you know around the world is is a big uh, is a big way and we I think I I like to see the big big picture and you know um, the future of our students and I, I have two younger um, I have two daughters and I uh, I just want to. Um, I always tell them every day, you know, have that positive mindset and, you know, um, just look at your teachers and they're, they're there for a reason. Everybody has a, uh, you know, a purpose here and, um, and I hope that my purpose serves, you know, the younger generations for, and for our students to um, be inspired um, to keep, um, you know, our, our unique ways and to learn through our, our people and our Himata. Thank you, and thank you for inspiring all of us, too. Dr. Whitaker. Yes, so let me see how I can do this um, in a miniskirt way, long enough to cover the essentials, but short enough to keep it interesting. So um, it's the, the idea of how we prepare the next generation is a critical thing, and, and part of my job is to kind of do that future-looking, um, kind of apply that perspective as we train our students and support faculty um, in the academic environment. So my job is to, and, and the way I see the future, is to create an ecosystem um, with all the supports and resources that anybody who comes into that ecosystem should be able to learn, develop, thrive, grow, and pursue anything that they want to do. Um, sounds idealistic, but it's possible. Um, the other piece is to make sure that our, our kids, d despite the limited exposure and being disenfranchised and under-resourced, change their worldview, um, expose them to things beyond where, you know, the neighborhoods that they grew up in and all of these things, yeah. and, and give them a chance to go out and explore and learn from others and our, and our partners. That's why we have to be very strategic in who comes to the table 
to engage and to make sure that this is a mutually beneficial thing. We, we work in a society where everything is very competitive. It's all about me and what I can accomplish, and sometimes at the expense of everybody else. You look at the academic setting, it's the department and the person and what you can do to get through P&T, but the entire world and, and the United States is now saying, you gotta collaborate, you gotta do team science, you gotta do all these collaborative things, you have to do internet too and the platform for research. But the mindset is not there, the culture is not there. And so we have to start thinking a little bit more broadly about what we do, a little bit beyond ourselves, be a little bit more altruistic and say, how can we help to build an ecosystem where everybody can come in and thrive, everybody gets to advance and grow, and that's part of that education. Yeah. Make it a little bit more um, inclusive and well-rounded. We're not quite there, but I, I think the opportunities are there and the future is bright, and we look forward to getting the support from organizations such as yours and all our funding agencies to make that happen. Thank you. So it's interesting you said one of the things you said, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it just a little bit. Um, I talked to a lot of people here over the last couple of days, and one of the things I heard a lot of was some really good oppositional defiant behavior, and I love that. So every time somebody says no, that's a really good reason to make it happen, right? So um, I heard that from many people at this uh, session where it was, no, you can't do this. Well, here I go. Um, but one of our values, um, one of the goals in your life from our cultural perspective is what, what, what you're trying to accomplish is to be a good person. And so you can, if you're a good person first, then whatever your profession is and whatever you're approaching comes from that place with good intention and with a hope for a good outcome, with good relationships. And so um, my utopia around all of this is that through the connections and through the research that we have, we um, help each other to understand this world that we live in and how we're interconnected and find that civility again and learn how to make space for um, perspectives that aren't ours and give them validity and allow for those communities that are often identified as deficit to recognize that maybe that's not the truth. Maybe that's our lens, and give those communities the opportunities to lead and be a part of. And that's one of the things I've enjoyed about this um, meeting that I've been in, is who is leading and what organizations are coming in. Because um, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, my business officer is always saying she wants to stake me down to the ground because I'm flying off into the universe. But I think you have to have that wish for all the best. And that when we do those things, we create the next generations, generations of leaders who will have the heart to make the world good. Wow. Thank you. Well. Uh Thank you all for sharing with us in a short period of time your incredible, invaluable perspectives. I'm, I am, and I think everybody's deeply appreciative of you being here with us today. Okay, I believe we have time for a few questions, and uh, if you do decide to ask a question, I'm going to ask you to walk to the microphones that are on both sides here, so that we can hear you, and uh, please, and yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mount Allen. I'm representing California State University Fresno and the San Francisco Jazz Organization. So, I mean, what has just been discussed is one of the most touching 
indicate communications of, of our cultures and our communities and some of the challenges that we have. And so if we look over the past 40 years, and I, and I use the 40 years because that's kind of when the internet started to come into practice, the, these certain cultures were not a part of that conversation. Certainly the HBCUs and the tribal nations were not a part of that development conversation. And that's not, a, that's not meaning to be um, discriminatory in any nature, it's just the, the nature of technological development is that's how those conversations originated and these cultures weren't a part of it. So the, I consider the Research Education Network to be the most substantial education technology tool there is on the planet. With that in mind, I'm really interested to, to, if you, now that you have a seat at the table, what are the possibilities that you see in terms of putting that different lens on all future developments of networks of this nature so they appropriately reflect that, that opportunity? That's it. Just a simple question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would any of you care? to go first? I'll take the stab. Um, OK, because that question covered a great deal. Um, you asked the question, but that question is a bit twofold. Because yes, you're right. Having a seat at a table means you're not on the menu. And it also means that we actually are there. And we are having those conversations. And we are placing those lenses for research in multiple environments. And we are addressing several issues. Are we going to address all of them? That's not, maybe not today. But I can say that, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what my grandfather used to tell me in a joke. He said, every waterfall starts with a single drop. One step at a time, the next best move. And based upon that, this is what we're doing. This is that first drop, or second drop in some, some cases. This is that next best move that we're making. And we're bringing more people with us. We're inviting more to join us because what I may see, she may see more. He may see be more beyond that. I see something different. So we're always having that conversation. Yes, we're going to be finding things that we don't normally do, but there are also other opportunities that we will be moving forward. You can't do it all at one time, and admittedly, as much as we would love to have all the tribal nations covered with broadband, with this magical, I'm going to get technical, IEEE 802.22 wireless broadband network set up that can handle that where they don't have to deal with any wires. Yes. Practically, no. But we can make the next best step forward. Thank you. Would any of you like to? I, I think I will just add that um, part of it is change in perspective in one, in one sense. So yeah. one, we have to get past the idea that we haven't been included in the past, and, but now we're here. We have to start from here and look ahead. It's not about dwelling on the tradition and history of what has happened, yet we know that's there, and we can address that in time. But for right now, it's how do we leverage all the things and opportunities that we have to start looking forward, to build and, and look forward. The other piece is we also have to make space for those who come after us. So the succession planning kind of thought process to make sure that when you leave the table, you make room for another one or two, um, like yourself. And we do have people who, who will say, no, I'm not ready, I'm not doing that. I see that all the time. I sit on study section at NIH, NSF, and I tell my colleagues, hey, I'm going to nominate you for, oh, no, I'm too busy, and I'm, I can't do this, and I can't do that. I only have that conversation one time. You, you're, not, you're not motivated, you're not there, that's fine. I'll, I'll ask somebody else. But we have to do this, and we have to make sure it's people who are willing to step out and do something, not, as I said earlier, beyond yourself, and, and just um, make sure you make space for those who are willing and able to create the opportunities for those who will come after. President Bohan, would you like to also say something, or we can, Deshaun? Um, no, I, I just think, um, but um, 
he said here is, is, is true, um, looking at the past and, you know, there's future steps ahead for everyone. And I just, um, you know, having the technical background and leader, being a leader at uh, my school is just, you know, it, it, it opens opportunities and for our students and, you know, and research and, um, and, you know, I'm just all for it. I just <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we're running a bit behind. We have time for one final question. So please. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Coffee Jack, representing Virginia Union University. Um, it's a small HBCU located in Richmond, Virginia. And my question comes from a um, IT professional standpoint with regard to research. So coming from an HBCU um, in an underfunded program where IT is dealing with daily things like server maintenance and patching and the like, when it comes to research, it kind of works its way down the priority list for, for an IT professional right, who needs to maintain operations in the IT department. But there still needs to be an effort towards advancing research at the university, and it, and it seems to be stemmed in IT, right? But your background, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm observing is that it's not stemmed in IT, but rather in academics in the provost area. Um, and so my question to simplify all of this is how do we go back to our universities? Because I, I can't go back to my president and say, uh, you need to hire a VP of research, right? So how do we, as IT, who is occupied with all of these daily things, make time or make research advancement a priority at the university, which sort of needs to have that academic um, effort behind it from the academic side, right? We need faculty, we need um, people who hold titles such as yourself, right? I like uh, how you're answering your own question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, you I, I just want, answered your question. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we, how do, how do I go back and, and, and make that bridge? You answered your own question, actually. You brought up, you, you mentioned that vice provost, provost office area, research area. But let's be clear, IT's general domain is supporting the institution. That's the general domain of IT. That's, they're not trying to design the next research initiative in IT. That's not an IT domain issue. That's an academic concept. IT's job is Frankly, when, we, when I was in IT, we were considered, we were support. We're a support organization. I would not necessarily go to facilities and, and ask the, the, my friend John, who handles the HVAC system, if he's trying to create the next greatest HVAC system. That's not in his domain. Now, when I, if I have a problem with the one in my house and I need a favor and a little help to get mine working and a little information, I'm going to him. But, what, you're, what we are asking now is that you have your academic side and your IT side have the conversation. Because academia, we need to be able to work with IT to set up that environment to create that cyber infrastructure so that some of the research that we're doing can actually be done. But I would be, I'm a bit reserved when you say, I'm gonna go to the IT department and ask them, hey, by the way, we're looking at doing research on fast TCP. Can you set me up a side network? That's there. I just need the network to be maintained. That's within their domain. And I would not be wanting, that's not something that I personally, from my area, would be going to IT about. That's an academic endeavor. So when you go back to your, your, back, back to your school, I would say, Nah, you would, this wouldn't be a conversation, not for IT, but for the academic research side of your institution. 
I would say you can go to your president and you can ask for the position. That's the first thing. Oh, yeah, uh, do it. Now. Second, <laughs> second, stick to the mission of your institution. Start there. And all the things that you're talking about are mainly faculty driven. We're there to set the ecosystem to provide the support for, for research to be done and all these things. Academic affairs is supporting the faculty and what they do. But that knowledge capital rests with the faculty. And all of our jobs, whether you're in IT, academic affairs, right. research, is to support and build that ecosystem, as I said, for the faculty to produce and deliver what they said they're going to do. It's their intellectual uh, property, and we just making a space for them to, to do it and do the best possible job to represent all of us who are in this space. OK. Well, we're at time, and uh, thank you for the excellent questions. It's a great seg for the next part of what's happening in the MSEC program. So uh, please join me in a huge round of applause for our outstanding speakers. Oh, standing ovation. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives with us. OK, we are a little bit past the time. We are adjourning. Quick set of announcements, final announcements, because this is our closing plenary. Uh, my colleague James uh, Deaton mentioned that uh, we have another opportunity to come together very soon in September in Minneapolis. Please save the date for our technology exchange. And I believe that's a wrap-up. Thank you, everyone.